Thank you, Lord. Praise God. It is a, it's a privilege to be back and be in the house and be with you. We were we were in uh, Lexington, Tennessee, last weekend with the barbers and their folks, and they were hosting their annual conference. And their subject uh, theme for the conference was manifesting sons. And uh, here I was, sort of thinking I had uh, kind of concluded my father son thing, and was trying to wrap my mind around. Kind of a summary of the last 12 times I preached that's supposed to be a book. Uh, and it just got me started all over again with some things. And uh, so that's going to spill over into today just a little bit. And uh, I hope you'll just uh, bear with me if I repeat myself very much. I don't want to do that. Uh, with that being said, I want to repeat a verse or two of scriptures that are so foundational before I take off down just a, hopefully a, a narrow thought that we can uh, digest and palate uh, in one setting. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I want to read verses 14 through 17, a very, very, very familiar uh, passage here because we've Spent so much time over the years talking about the uh, the whole idea of of what it means to have real spiritual fathers in our lives and the need for that and uh, and just preface this whole thing again with the whole idea that it's not a gender thing uh, it's the heart of the father uh, that's that speaks through us as as human vessels whether we we be male or female. Uh, let me just read this, and then I'm going to just kind of share my heart with you with some, uh, some other thoughts. But <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. If you're with me, say amen. amen. He says, I'm not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved son or my beloved children. He says, for even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. He says, for I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you to imitate me. And that's why I sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of how I follow Christ Jesus, just as I teach in all the churches wherever I go. Uh, I want to read that to you from the passage or the Passion Translation, uh, if you'll just hear me for just a minute. Verse 14, he, this is the Passion Translation. He says, I am not writing this to embarrass you. Or to shame you, but to correct you as the children I love. For although you could have countless babysitters in Christ telling you what you're doing wrong, you don't have many fathers that correct you in love. He says, I am a true father to you, for I became your father when I gave you the gospel, and I brought you into union with Jesus, the anointed one. So I encourage you, my children, to follow the example that I live before you. And that's why I've sent my dear son Timothy, whom I love. He is, a, he is faithful to the Lord Yahweh and will remind you of how I conduct myself as one who lives in union with Jesus, the Anointed One, and of the teachings that I bring to every church, every where. Amen. Holy Spirit, give us an ear to hear today what is in your heart today, Father. 
I just pray that you would minister to each and every person wherever we find ourselves today. Stretch forth your hand in this place. Heal broken hearts. Heal wounded hearts. Heal us spirit, soul, and body. Uh, make us whole today. Uh, empower your church. Empower your people today, Father, to be everything uh, that you have purposed us to be. And we just ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, there's like a hundred different things that goes in my mind when I, when I read that passage of Scripture about not having many fathers and how that there's those that teach us what, what, what the Scripture really is referring to is elementary things. Uh, teachers that teach us fundamentals. And, and how many of you know we need fundamentals? Amen. This is, not, this is not to say that we don't need the instructions and the teachings of, of elementary things, but I thought the Passion Translation really hit something that, uh, that we, uh, we often are all victims of, is uh, sometimes it is, it is in that elementary, immature stage where it's almost like we hear more about no, no, no. Don't do that, and don't do that, and don't do that. It's almost uh, often just a series of, uh, uh, of, of corrections in our lives that's saying, well, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, you did that wrong. Uh, but Paul started that, that statement when he's talking about who he was and how he related to this, these people with, with something that, that's just sort of hit me deep in the last few weeks that I, I want to add to this whole thing about talking about the, the father and the son light. And, and that was this idea of shame. Uh, I've talked about the heart of the father and the voice of the father and, 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 and talked a lot about the power of affirmation and hearing that affirmation from the voice of the father and how powerful it is and uh, how it impacts us uh, and we say that especially as children, and I know that's a true statement, but, but I want to tell you something. I don't care how old you are, and if you're a male or a female, there is still this ongoing, empowering and need in our lives for, for real affirmation. Amen. I got one. This is, this is right. I think that's an amen. Uh, when Paul was talking about Timothy, this was not a, a, a child. Paul was talking about a son who was a, who was a young man, already in ministry. Amen? And when Paul's writing this letter to the church at Corinth, he's not writing to a bunch of kids. He's writing to an adult, although acting very immature. He's writing to grown-up, supposed to be grown-up Christians. Amen? Uh, but he says, I'm writing to you like beloved children. Amen? But he, but he used this phrase, he said, I'm not writing this to embarrass you. Have you ever been embarrassed? No? <laughs> it's one thing to do something and embarrass you. It's something else when, when somebody, especially somebody who's supposed to be a voice of affirmation in your life, are the ones that bring about your embarrassment. Amen. Uh, so Paul says, I'm not writing to shame you. Uh, sometime last year during our, one of our mentoring classes, I came across uh, a, a TED talk, and it was a, from, a, from, from a lady by the name of Brene Brown. Uh, it really spoke powerfully to me back then, and, and little did I know that I was about to be involved in a situation where really someone who was, who was really struggling uh, with some things, ministry people, people that was, uh, someone who had put themselves in a real uh, compromising uh, bad situation. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't know it at the time, but I really believe God had, God was preparing me for, for a time of ministry, for my heart and my attitude to, to be ready to walk through something with someone who, who was really bringing themselves into a place of embarrassment and, and a potential for shame. Uh, Brene Brown, and I would encourage you to go find it sometimes. You can look it up. It's a TED Talk, Brene Brown. 
and she talks about shame and vulnerability. Vulnerability. Uh, and she said this, and, it, and, it's, and I hadn't forgot it. She said, the thing about shame is the power of shame and this cycle of shame that bring, we bring into our lives uh, from wherever it comes from. The, there's a few things that, that is common with everybody who lives with this, with this, uh, this struggle of shame. Uh, sometimes we call it depression. Uh, we, we call it whatever we want to call it. But at the heart of it, there's this, there's this spirit of shame. And, it, and here's a couple of things that, it, that it's pretty common with everybody. Is one, it brings us into a place of secrecy or isolation. People who live with shame, people who struggle with shame, uh, oftentimes find themselves coming, moving themselves into a place of isolation and secrecy. And, and the other thing is it, it, it brings us to a place of silence where we don't want to talk about it. Or we just say what you heard earlier just a little bit ago where Joy was talking about. We, we, we just kind of cover this thing up with I'm okay or I'm fine. Uh, just a few weeks ago and over the last few weeks, there's been a, uh, a new kind of public spectacle of another minister of the gospel who's committed suicide, taking his own life. Uh, that's always bothered me. Uh, but it seems like Lately, it bothers me more uh, for some reason. I don't know if it's just a season of life where I'm at or just what, what's going on in me. But, uh, but when, you, uh, when you try to wrap your mind around how could a person come to the place that they're so desperate and so hopeless that that seems to be the only answer, I, I don't know that I can get my heart and my mind to think ar- around that. Uh, but just with this past week, as I was processing some of this, it, it, it's almost like God sabotaged me, uh, kind of ambushed me, I guess. Unintentionally, I didn't know what was happening, but I was, uh, Pastor Kevin was there, Brenda, some people. I was ministering, and as often as it happens, uh, God gives me these images and these visions, and I see things. Uh, that, that I share with people, they're, whether they're words of knowledge, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but this one, I had no idea what was about to happen because the Lord gave me this vision of, of, a, of a young, uh, or not a, uh, an elderly lady actually sitting there. And God gave me this vision to share with her. And in this vision, I, I heard the Lord say to me, she, He showed me a prison cell. And in, that, and in that prison cell, all I could see was just pitch dark, darkness. And, and the Lord spoke to me and said to tell her that this was a prison that her son was in. And, uh, but the Lord said to tell her that the door had been swung wide open. And, and, and I used to be, I used to be uh, excited when God gave me things, and then I tried to figure things out. But now I've just kind of come to the place. I just say, this is what I see, and, and I leave it alone. Uh, because more times than not, it ain't what I think it is. And this one really wasn't what I thought it was. For one, I didn't know she had a son. I certainly didn't know she had a son in prison. Uh, but when, when I began to speak that word, people around her obviously knew some things, and she really began to be broken. And, and I really believe God began to do some healing for her. But it was totally different than anything I thought. Because what I found out afterward is that we were standing there on that day, and that word to her was given to her on the anniversary of her son's suicide. Uh, shame is a powerful thing. Shame is, is, is more than just an emotion. Shame is not just a feeling. Uh, I think people that are, that, are, that are bound in these places of isolation and shame, uh, they're, they're dealing with much more than just uh, being disappointed. Amen. One thing Brene Brown said, and others have said, but one of the things she said that was powerful to me is, is there such a thing as healthy guilt or conviction? There is this sense of guilt that I did something wrong and I need to adjust or be corrected. Amen. I talked about the discipline of a father. There's a balance to this. Uh, but, but guilt says I did this and I need to correct it or make it right. 
Shame says, I did this, so now I am this. There's a huge difference in, in, in failing and being a failure. Amen. There's a big difference in, 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 in doing something, whatever it might be, uh, missing the mark, sinning, falling short. We use that language. But whatever that is, the, the thing, the, what shame does is it, come, it moves inward. And then we begin to identify ourselves as that failure and then we take on an identity that is really a behavior. Amen? Some of you have heard me share this, and I'm not going to re-preach it or retell it, but I, I, can, I can remember as a young man, especially in my high school teenage years, being around uh, my friends and their fathers who had somewhat of healthy father-son relationships and being around some teachers and some instructors and later in college. And, and it dawned on me as I've been studying and processing all of this, the thing that, the thing that, that was so empowering to me uh, as a young man was not the voice of my father. I never heard his affirmation. I never heard him say, he was proud of me or that he loved me or that he believed in me. I never heard those words from my father. And I'm not asking for your pity, but what I am telling you is that when I did hear it, I was usually hearing it from a teacher or a coach or an instructor, somebody that was speaking uh, affirmation and, 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 and confidence and, and not always saying what you can't do, but what you can do. Amen? And many of those people corrected me pretty strict sometimes, especially coaches. Amen? Y'all okay? Uh, when Paul says, I'm not writing this to shame you, it blew my mind when I read that one time. I was thinking about how, what Paul said and how he put these two th thoughts together. He said, I'm not writing to embarrass you. I'm not writing to shame you. He says, I'm writing you because I love you, because I'm writing to you like a father to his children. He says, you've got lots of instructors. He used that language. And then he says, and for this reason, I'm sending you Timothy. Think about that. Paul said, I want you to comprehend how I feel about you what my thoughts are about you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm sending you Timothy. Literally, what Paul is doing is saying, I'm going to send you. I'm not coming to correct you. I'm sending you living proof of what it looks like to be my son, and you're going to see it in Timothy. Amen? He said, when you see Timothy... You're going to think of me. When you hear Timothy, you're going to think of me. In other words, you're going to see modeled out, walked out, expressed in a, in a person what a son looks like to me. Amen? Y'all okay? Um, give me 2 Timothy. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to hurry to get to where I want to go. Um, 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy, which is it? Second Timothy. Who's driving up there? All right. Good. I know what time I started today, by the way. <laughs> Second Timothy. I always remind people of this. I know y'all know it, but I just remind you. Always be thoughtful of when you read the Scripture of who wrote it and who the audience was. Yes, Amen. Amen. Yes, Timothy didn't write Timothy. Paul wrote Timothy. Some people think just the name on the book tells you who wrote it, but be careful. This is not a letter from Timothy. This is a letter to Timothy. Amen? It's not even a letter to the churches. We are eavesdropping on a father talking to a son. Y'all okay? Paul says to Timothy, study to show yourself what? Say it again. Say it again. Approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be what? Ashamed. And we, how many of you know, we just read stuff and go, oh, that's good. But here is a father saying to his son, when you study, don't study to find 
What disqualifies you? Always study to find yourself approved. Always study. I don't know about you, but I grew up in the church system, especially as a teenager. After I got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, man, I mean, I was like, we can conquer the world. And then just, it didn't take long at all till I come to this place of this. I am not ever going to measure up to this. I don't qualify. I can't, I mean, I mean, the preacher would get up and say, God knows your thoughts. And I just like want to slide under the pew. <laughs> he knows your heart. And I'm going, oh, Lord, if he knows my heart. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't affirming or assuring for me to know that God was looking in on me deep. Because down deep, I still had some issues. I still got some issues. Some of you do too. Well, let me just change it. So do you. <laughs> uh, so most of, the, most of the time when I was growing up, especially as a young, young but even as a young pastor, uh, my insecurities uh, were, were deep rooted, and I didn't know it. Uh, I've, I've already shared this, but I'll just remind you again. Most of my drive and my confidence and my de- my desire to achieve and accomplish and be uh, was not coming out of confidence. It was coming out of rebellion. I mean, most of most of everything I did from a young man on was out of this attitude: is I'm going to do this despite you and without you, and I'm going to prove to you I don't need you. Amen? I didn't use those words, <laughs> but that was my attitude. Uh, it wasn't out of, I believe I can and somebody else believes I can. It was nobody believes I can, I'm going to prove to you I can. So I became very self-sufficient. I became very... Uh, I mean, not that I didn't have success. I, I had success in life, in family, in business, all those kind of things. We were successful. And even in ministry, we were successful. But, but, but my attitude, once God really started checking my heart, my attitude sucked. <laughs> Stunk. And God knew that. Uh, so over the last several years, he's been really working on my heart about my attitude. Uh, not just what we do, but why we do it. Amen? Is everybody okay? I know this ain't gonna, we ain't going to swing on the chandeliers today. Uh, but I, did, I, never, I never really really associated that with shame and insecurities because cause, cause, cause I always felt like, well, I, I'm pretty confident, you know, about things. And... Uh, but then I began to look around, and I began to look at other ministers, and I began to look at, uh, you know, have the privilege to, to, to sit with some of the leaders in the church and hear, hear things. And, and, and what I found out is, is, is most people are not, are not willing to be really vulnerable and really be transparent. Never publicly and rarely, if ever, privately. Amen? Now, I'm going to start this, this but, but they say, you can't tell everybody everything. Amen. You can't tell everybody everything. But God help the person who can't tell anybody something. Amen? Y'all okay? I want to talk about breaking the power of shame. I was... I was I was really messed up after I had a conversation with the folks uh, who was aware of what had happened with this, this young woman or this lady and her son who had committed suicide and just had got through following some posts and some Facebook stuff and reading some, some, some blogs about pastoral ministry and, and some of the things that was happening and the pressures, the anxiety, the depressions, the secrecy, all those things. All that stuff was fresh in my mind. And, uh, and, and I just heard the Lord say that it is the responsibility of a father and the voice of a father to break away the shame from our sons. To break away the shame from our sons. Uh, there's uh, endless examples in the Bible, 
I believe, of the pattern that Jesus set for us. One of those, how many of you remember the story where Jesus comes to the woman of Samaria at the well, the woman at the well in John 4? You know, the scripture says Jesus told his disciples, I have to go to Samaria, and he walks this long journey. And he comes, uh, he comes to this well, and, and somehow he's got some distance between him and the disciples, and it's just Jesus. And Jesus approaches this woman, and, and the scripture says she was there alone, which means she was, she was isolating herself, obviously, from everybody else, because the whole community used the well. Amen? But she would find a time that nobody else was there to go and to draw water from the well. And, and Jesus crossed so many cultural boundaries in that story that we could go on and on about all of them. But just the fact that this Jew is approaching the Samaritan who happens to be a woman and they do it in public, all those things. And, and she's very religious, you know. And uh, Jesus starts telling the story. She starts talking about this mountain, that mountain, worship here, worship there. And she gets all religious. And Jesus just kind of went to the heart of something when he said, he says, well, let's go get your husband. He's sneaky like that. He says, let's go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. He says, well, that's right. You've had five, and the one you have is not your own. And, uh, man, automatically, I mean, all, for years I've, I've thought this, but never put it together until I heard Chris Valentin allude to it in one of his podcasts I was listening to. And, and it dawned on me, wow, I missed that whole thing the whole time. In their culture, it was not possible or legal for a woman to divorce a man. This... So, so we're thinking about this woman is some kind of a harlot or something, but the reality is this is a woman who has been, who has been used, abused, and rejected at least five times by five men. She is not the one who's put herself in this position. She's the one who has literally become a victim. Of this culture. This is a woman who now has a man standing in front of her. Talking to her. And you can imagine the, 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 the wall that she's got. Amen. The shame that her community has, has given her. Amen. And Jesus goes right to the heart of the issue. And talks to her about what's missing down inside of her. This well of living water. and Amen. What shame. Something about religion and shame just kind of work hand in hand sometimes. Amen. I, I, I'm not talking about real Christianity. I'm talking about religion. Amen. Amen. How it's always shaming us into hopefully modifying our behavior or whatever. You know, it's like we don't want to uh, we don't want to deal with the shame, so we're gonna we're gonna do whatever pleases the Father, and 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 then we get into this performance and fear based relationship. Amen. That's why I don't get mad at me if you if you do this. If you got them, just God bless you. But all these people running around wanting to put the Ten Commandments in their yard and everywhere else, you can have them. Amen. The New Covenant is a higher, higher, higher order that only gives us two commands. Amen. That says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, and your neighbor as yourself, right? Amen. Yep. You ever thought about that? Love your neighbor how? As yourself. How? As yourself. Listen, it's okay to love yourself. You really should. Amen. See, some of, some of us have, been, have, been, have taken in this shame to some point that we think it's healthy to just abase ourselves and go around with our heads hung down. We call it humility. Amen. And, and, and religion reinforces that. It keeps us in this place of some humble servant. Amen. Uh, so a lot of the culture where Jesus is preaching and teaching and how he's interacting with society and human beings gives us a real indication of what, how the Father would interact with us and, you know, the Scripture says Jesus was the exact replica, the exact imprint and the exact duplication of the Father. If you, I, I often tell people, if you want to know how the Father feels about something, just watch Jesus. 
Amen? Just watch Jesus and how he handled certain things in certain situations. And just, just like he interacts with the woman at the well. And how many of you remember the lady who comes in with the issue of blood? And the scripture says she's pressing in the crowd and she touches Jesus at the hem of his garment, you know? Uh, there's, there's a part of that story that sometimes if we're not careful, we miss. This woman, by, by their own culture and by their own rules and regulations, she is, she, she is not just ceremonially, but socially, she is an outcast, an outsider who is unclean. And she was supposed to be standing over here at a distance that when anybody began to approach her, she was supposed to be going, Unclean! Unclean! How, how many of you would love to be in a society that every time somebody comes to you, have sinner, adulterer, liar, alcoholic? See, that's, what, that's the root of shame is it causes us to say what we are based on our circumstances. Amen? But this woman secretly keeps her mouth shut, presses in, touches Jesus, and he stops and goes, Whew. What was that? Amen? All the religious crowd was touching him, and Jesus didn't, he wasn't moved. But when she touched him, something went out from him, right? Okay. So, I want to read a story to you. This story I've preached many times over the years. Uh, but let me just read the passage, if I can. Second um, Samuel chapter four, and then we'll jump to chapter nine. And Second Samuel chapter four, and then we'll jump to nine. Is everybody awake? We all know, well, I'm going to say we all know. We, we should all know, and most of us have heard, the story of David. David, who's chosen, obviously, by the prophet Samuel, known as a king. He's a shepherd to his father, his brothers, and his fathers really don't even bring him in, you know, for the anointing. Everybody, uh, the prophet comes and says, I'm looking for the next king. And he, David, you know, he's left out in the field, that kind of stuff. Uh, Long, long, long way down the road, David has now finally come to the throne. He's king. Uh, during that journey, this, this covenant relationship that, was, that started between David and Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, the king, uh, they, they had something that uh, is, is very difficult to define for some people, this relationship that David had uh, with Jonathan and how he honored uh, Saul, even though Saul was not very honorable. Uh, but what happened is there came a day where Jonathan uh, and Saul both die the same day in battle. And this is where the story can be picked up. It says, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame that was lame of his feet. Listen, he was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass that as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Five years old, he is the grandson to the king, Saul. He is the son of Jonathan. The day his father and grandfather die, the nurse that is, that is taking care of him literally drops him in some way, in some accident, and he becomes crippled in his feet, both of them. Now, some people say, well, she dropped him and he became crippled. I would rather tell you he became fatherless and became crippled. Amen? How many of you know you, you can get over some physical things? 
You can get over some hurts in the flesh and in the in the in our in our in our human body. We can we can recover, but but I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that are crippled today, and they're not crippled in their physical feet, but they are crippled in their walk. Amen. Amen. So let's go to chapter nine and let's just read through this story and I'm going to read the whole thing and just try not to interrupt myself. (laughs) David said, is there any left from the house of Saul that I can show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was from the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they heard And when they called him to David, the king said to him, he said, are you Ziba? He said, thy servant is he. The king said, was there not yet any from the house of Saul that I can show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said to the king, Jonathan has yet a son which is lame on his feet. Isn't it interesting? I'm interrupting myself. That here is a third generation royal lineage son. The king don't even know if he lives. The king don't know where he's at. And yet when somebody identifies him, they know that he's Jonathan's son, but they also know that he's lame in his feet. I, I don't know about you, but... but we, we've, we spent years working with Celebrate Recovery and some of the recovery programs and... Uh, while while those there was a lot a lot a lot of good stuff uh, through our celebrate recovery, we I was always pretty adamant about that. I really have a problem with people standing up and say, "Hey, my name is this, and I'm a this." It's my microphone, so you can't stop me from saying that today. <laughs> and if you disagree, that's fine. Uh, but here's, the, here's my problem with that. See, I, I'm not going to get up here and say my name is Marlon and, and, and I'm an adulterer. Or that I'm a this or I'm a that. Because what we do is we bring the shame of that behavior into our identity. Amen. Now, I may have done some of those things, but those things are not who I am. See, shame gets a deep root down inside of us that brings us into a place of isolation and secrecy and condemnation that causes us to drop our heads and, and, and to live in this place of disconnection. I got a, I got a question for you. Who, who in your life, that if you hit rock bottom today, in your worst situation, who could you go to and be honest with? Don't just give me God, that's a cop out. Who in flesh could you go to and say, I need help? If you can't answer that question, you are in trouble, my friend. If there's not a person in your life, I'm talking about a person, not don't give me God. I know God is the answer. But God shows up in flesh. God is smarter than we are. And when God said, I'm going to come down and relate to humanity, He didn't send us a book. He didn't send us angels. He wrapped Himself in human flesh and said, I'm going to show you how I can relate to you. And He does it through a human body, through His Son made flesh. If there is not a person in flesh that you can be accountable to, that you can be honest with, you are in a dangerous place. I said it before, I said, yeah, you can't trust everybody with everything. But you better find somebody you can trust. Amen. So, so David is crying out. It's interesting to me. David's fought all these battles. He's conquered all this stuff. David is finally sitting in this place in the throne. A king that can do anything. Can win any battle. Conquer any place. And his heart goes back to Listen to this. I really need to find a way to show kindness to somebody from the house of Saul and Jonathan. So he calls Ziba. Ziba says, yes, Jonathan has a son, but he's lame on his feet. And 
David said, where is he? Ziba said, well, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel in Lodibar. I could go on and on when I get into this passage of Scripture, but those, those names are pretty powerful to me. Maker means to be sold. More, more, more uh, distinctly, it means to be sold into slavery or sold into bondage. So here's a five-year-old who gets sold into this place of obscurity and this place of shame because he's lost his father, he's lost his grandfather, but let me tell you, he lost a lot more than that. He lost his identity. He lost his heritage. He lost his history. And then he goes into shame and goes into this house of being sold into slavery, lo- losing his identity, and he's living in a place called Lodi Bar, which literally means to be in a place without pasture, to be in a place where he has no shepherd, no flock. Isolated, secret. I love this. So David fetched him. <laughs> oh, that sounds like something we'd say in the South. Wouldn't it? Go fetch him. Keep going. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, when he came to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, he said, Behold your servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And listen to this. I will restore you all the land of Saul, your, Saul, your father, and you will eat bread at my table continually. So he bowed himself and he said, What is your servant that you would look upon, or look upon such a de- dead dog as I am? I mean, you know, this guy's got some identity issues. So the king called Ziba, Saul's servant. He said unto him, I have given your master's son all that pertain to Saul. That's two generations up, by the way. And hid all his house. He says, therefore, your sons and your servants, they will till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, will eat bread at my table. And now Ziba had what? Fifteen sons. Now listen, oftentimes we read this and go, he got the land. He got the, he got the crops. He got the houses. But let me tell you what he really got. He got his identity back. And he found himself in a place where the king said to him, I'm giving you what belonged to your father. I'm giving you what belonged to your grandfather. And not only that, today in one word from the king, you're going to have 15 sons. I know somebody says, well, in their culture, it's a big deal. Amen? He got his heritage back. Here he is with lame feet, shame, isolated. And a king comes along and says, I'm going to give you what you've lost. Amen? The... uh, There's more than one application, I know, and we've preached it, and Pastor Kevin and I both have used the Scripture more than once. You know, Jesus said he came to seek and save that which was lost, not them which was lost. Jesus came to bring something back, that that was lost, and it was obviously this relationship with the Father, this identity thing. But I was thinking about what was lost in the garden and how it happened. You know, the Scripture says that in Genesis chapter 2, the Scripture says that when God created the man and the woman, and it ends that chapter by saying this. It says they were naked and not ashamed. Amen? They had no covering, no, nothing to hide. Nothing. Amen? And then when they took and ate the fruit, the Scripture says their eyes were opened, and the first thing they did was they felt shame. And guess what they did? They hid themselves. Amen. See, that's what shame does to us. It drives us into a place of hiding. We hide it with our words. We hide it with our our religious activities. We hide it with with whatever successes we think we can do in life. But secretly, when we're dealing with shame, 
when you lay your head on your pillow at night, when you ain't got nobody there to, to deal with stuff and you're not being distracted, uh, there's something that gnaws at you. Amen? Hallelujah. When I heard the Lord say to me, fathers, fathers are called to break the, sh the shackles of cha the sh the sh these chains and these shackles of shame off of people. I thought, how do we do that? How do we do that? I've, uh, I've watched, I've watched some, some folks go through some stuff privately and ministry people go through some things and, 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 and I've, I've watched two very different behaviors. Amen? Uh, one of them is, is in that place of failure, in that place of disappointment, that place of what could be shame. It can become a very humbling opportunity for God to be, to, for God to really do some deep healing in us. Amen? If we let Him. But oftentimes what happens is we cover those things up rather than be transparent and vulnerable. Amen? Now, you don't need to get on Facebook and tell your business. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying today. But, but let me tell you, you've got to find that place where you can be intimate, transparent, and honest with somebody that has the heart of our Father. Somebody that wants you to succeed. Somebody that says to you, yeah, you may have messed up. You may have done this, but that's not who you are. Amen. So David brings in Mephibosheth and he brings him out of a place of no pasture and he restores to him not just land and servants, but sons. But he brings him to his table. What's the next verse? Is that the last one? And then said Ziba to the king, according to all that the Lord, my Lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he will eat at my table. How? As one of the what? King's sons. Give me Psalm 103. I'm going to start closing. Um, it's dangerous for me to go here because this, this, I, I, I get this visual image of, of Mephibosheth coming in all crippled and lame. I don't know what he looks like, but, but, but you got to realize who all's sitting at David's table. You go read about David's mighty men. You go read about David's, David's band of brothers. I mean, every one of them sitting around there, and I mean, they're bad dudes. And then here comes this frail, weak, insecure. The most royal one at the table. But he can't walk by himself. And he slides his feet under the table. And I always get this image that once he gets his feet under the table, he looks like everybody else at the table. Amen. 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 Psalm 103. Did I give you that? Psalm 103. Now David is the one who's bringing Mephibosheth back. But David is also the one, I don't know if you've thought about it, the first thing David did when he came to the throne, the very first thing he did, he said, where's the presence of God at? They said, well, the Philistines have stole the ark. David said, we're going to go fetch that thing. <laughs> uh David was a worshiper. I know he was a warrior, but at his heart, he was a worshiper. He, he, he said, we've got to get the presence of God back. 
And, and he didn't do it perfectly, but it worked out in the end. <laughs> we won't go into all that. Uh, but I think David had a, I think David had a, almost a new covenant revelation of God uh, that just kind of went against the grain in the Old Testament. Amen? You know, they would be doing all this ritual ceremony stuff, and David would just kind of get wild and dance and praise God. You know, they had, all this, they had all this official liturgy and all these ways you approach God, and David would just put a tent out on a hill and say, worship God. You know. But I think he also had a revelation of God's grace, God's mercy, that's rare in the Old Testament. Amen? Listen to this. He says, let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise His holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things He does for me. His forgiveness, He forgives all, if I say all, 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 all my sins. He forgives all my sins. Now David has got listing the things. Don't forget this. Amen? See, when I, now don't, don't think I've changed topics. Think about David and think about Mephibosheth. Think about David maybe saying this to Mephibosheth. Don't forget. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. He redeems your He redeems you from death. He crowns you with love and tender mercy. He fills your life with good things. Your youth is renewed like eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed His character to Moses, but His deeds to the people of Israel. He is compassionate, merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For His unfailing love toward those who fear Him is as great as the height of heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Now listen, He is like a father to His children, tender, compassionate, to those who fear, and I would rather say revere, Him. Man, that, that chapter just preached all by itself. Amen? I thank you, Father. To me, this whole idea of removing the shame, the guilt, the condemnation. Uh, so much of my research and reading over the last year or so, year and a half, has, been, has really been, uh, been focused on how we raise our children. I'm talking about young children, our kids, our teenagers. Uh, this has sort of spilled over into a different dimension for me. Now I look at leaders and I look at moms and dads because here's what happens is we become, uh, we become this image, this imitation, this... Uh, we, we take all of this into us and it becomes who we are. And we let it make us who we are. And, and oftentimes without even being consciously aware of it, we begin to project that same thing onto our children. 
when the when the hurting and the healing needs to happen inside of the what's hurting us is inside of us it needs to be healed amen I was uh I was reading that psalm again the other day, thinking about how God wants to heal us and how we need to become agents for that, for other people. Uh, While David's listing these things in the psalm, he gets to that last couple of verses I read, 11, 12, I think, 10, 11, 12. He says, you know, God's love, it's higher than the heavens. It's higher than the heavens. And he's, he's almost trying to give us this, this image of, you know, it's bigger than you can think. It's bigger than you can really imagine. And then he says he takes our sins and he forgives them and he removes them as far as the east is from the west. And... Uh, that phrase and the, even that song has been going through my head for several days. Y'all know the song? Is it Casting Crown song? Give right You know, how far is the east from the west? And, and, and the song, the, the answer is from one scarred hand to the other, right? Uh, that's a beautiful picture. Uh, But when I, was, when I was really meditating on that scripture and, and God sent me an answer of how, how far the east is from the west and, and he showed me the tabernacle. When Moses set up the tabernacle, the scripture says that it, no matter where they set up the tabernacle, they always set it up with the door facing east. Always. No matter where they went, when they, when they set up the tabernacle, the tabernacle is basically just, just this, almost like a, a, a privacy fence around this tent, and, and God's, God's living in this tent in the wilderness, but they would set it up with the door facing the east. The temple was built with the door facing the east. So that if you are going to approach the tabernacle. If you're going to come into the tabernacle, you have to come in through the east. Y'all with me? What if, what if this language is more prophetic? It tells us what God is really doing with our sin. He's taken us from the east to the, to the west. When you walk in the east door, the first thing you come to is a brazen labor. It's where the blood, I mean, this is the, it's like the cross. It's the mutilating of, of, the, of Jesus hanging on the cross. And, and, and I don't know about you, but uh, please don't get offended when I say this. Uh, the gospel is more than the cross. Thank God for the cross. But if all we do is drag a sinner to the foot of the cross and let them see an innocent man hanging on the cross being beaten and mutilated because of no sin of his own, we've really not given them hope. If, If we're not careful, we bring people to that place and we leave them there. And all we do is say, God, how could you allow this to happen to your son? And and when this is what I deserve. Amen. Many, many years ago, I was ministering. We were, I mean, God was healing. And I mean, we were seeing manifestations of God's presence and supernatural things just almost, not almost regularly. And uh, I read this story of a young lady. And, and the lady who come to our church was telling the same thing. How that she would go to church and, and she would sit there in church bound and, and needing healed and needing delivered and just living in this cycle of addiction and abuse. And, and she would come and go and come and go and come and go. And finally, a minister walked up and said, what is it, what keeps you from 
coming and, and getting what, you know, being healed and being restored. And she said, I come in here and I sit every Sunday and I see that man hanging on a cross and I'm thinking, he can't help me. See, the truth is, for many people, they've not got him off the cross yet. So when you come from the east to the west, you come in and there's the brazen labor, there's the blood, the sacrifice, the suffering of Jesus. And, and, as you, and as you, the further you go west, then you come and then you have a table of showbread and you have, you have the brazen labor, you got the candlestick and all the furniture. Finally, you come to this veil and behind the veil is what's called the Ark of the Covenant, which guess what is there? What David Desired as much as anything, the presence of God. But it's a place called the mercy seat. And how beautiful it is to think this is what God did with your sin. As far as the east is from the west, He took you from the cross to your cleansing, to working in us inwardly, transforming us inwardly, bringing us to the place into His presence. God told Moses, he said, I'll meet with you and I'll commune with you between the cherubims at the mercy seat. Bringing us to a place of communion and fellowship with God at the mercy seat. Amen. It's not a coincidence that when Jesus hung his head on the cross and said it's finished, that the veil was torn. Amen. Till Osborne said it better than anybody I ever heard. When, when, the, when the veil was torn from the top to the bottom, it was God saying to the religious group that day and that whole religious system, He says, you're no longer in business. Amen. And it wasn't God trying to get you to Him. It was God saying, I'm coming to you. Amen. Let's stand. I'm quitting. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Just bow your head with me. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I just, I just want us to really make room today for God to do some healing in us. I was, I was sort of wrestling with God a little bit myself, thinking, Lord, I just, I just don't know how to say this, and I'm not sure this is a Sunday morning kind of thing. Uh, Majority of these people are saved. Majority of these people are serving God. You know, most of these people are Christians. And, and, and I was just kind of wrestling with that. I think God really wants to heal some people today. I really think God wants to heal some people today. Lord, take away the shame today. Take away the guilt that's unhealthy. The insecurities Lord, I pray for a restoration today of, of true identity, of who we are as sons.
The scripture says that Hebrews chapter 2, that Jesus has sanctified us and made us one with Him. And He did that, the Scripture says, so He could bring many sons to glory. And then it goes on to say, and He's not ashamed to call you brethren. Amen. The Father is not ashamed of you. The Father is not ashamed of you. Jesus is not ashamed of you. Lord, I just pray that you would break the shackles, the chains of condemnation and insecurity and shame that's gripped some of us. That we believe we are who you say we are because of what you've done. Restore, restore, restore. Heal, Lord, heal. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to say this because I feel like God told me this before I ever started. And, and I'm not asking you to respond or come and do anything. But let me tell you something. The spirit of suicide is, is very subtle. It's subtle. Uh, somebody here, maybe it's you, maybe it's somebody you know, somebody really needs to, uh, you, need, you need to take a real stance today to resist and reject that. Not many years ago, I sat with my bishop, my spiritual father, who was going through uh, multiple issues, health issues, psychological things going on. Uh, I sat with him. We talked. And while I knew he wasn't good, I knew he wasn't healthy, I knew he was going through some things. A week after we sat and talked, he took a gun and took his life. A thousand times I thought, how did I not see that? Thank you, Lord. Over a period of time, a short time after his death, I can tell you now, looking back, shame, condemnation, insecurity, so many things I can't even, can't even, I can't even talk about. Those things, uh, Those, those things bring a man or a woman to a place that, that, that unless you're there, I don't think you can comprehend it. Just place your hand right here. I, I, I'm going to quit. Lord, I release healing today. I release healing right now in the name of Jesus. We break the power of guilt and condemnation, shame. God, I pray that the voice of the Father is heard, that it echoes into the hearts and the, and the spirit of these Your people. That the Father is pleased, that the Father loves, that Your love is higher than the heavens. That You forgive our sins and remove them as far as the east is from the west. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. 
Thank you, Father. You ever, you ever thought about the difference between Judas and Peter? Both of them denied the Lord. You know? And Judas, after he denies the Lord and they come and they arrest Jesus, the, the Scripture says he goes out and he hangs himself. You know what Judas did? He went into isolation. He went into shame. Amen? Amen? But Peter denied him too. Peter denied him three times, right? But Peter, Peter's, Peter is still there. By the time they crucified Jesus and he's dead and buried and resurrected, I love what the Scripture says. Jesus comes to, to Mary and Mary after his resurrection. He says, go tell the disciples and Peter that I go before them into Galilee. It was interesting to me that Jesus kind of pulled Peter out of that and says, make sure you tell Peter. Amen? Here's, I, I don't know who said this, but I've heard it somewhere. If Judas would have waited three more days, then Jesus hanging would have been His hanging. Amen? Thank you, Father. Father, I release today the grace for healing in this place, Lord. I rebuke and break the power of shame, suicide, insecurity. I break the power of it over the minds of Your people today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I break the power of it today. Lord, I say today that there is no shame 